Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on revising policies and procedures under the new European Data Protection Regulation. Uh, firstly, um, this webinar is for one hour. My name is Richard Campo. I'm a GRC consultant with uh, IT Governance. Um, and my responsibilities and my background, I've spent 20 years now with uh, data protection and information security, um, predominantly uh, with information security. Uh, and over the last six years, I've focused on uh, data protection, uh, compliance with data protection, and more recently on uh, uh, compliance with the general data protection regulation itself. Um, a quick introduction to IT governance. Um, my role's in the GRC department, that stands for uh, Governance, Risk and Compliance. Um, but we also uh, are a sort of a large team which, which also uh, covers cyber resilience, uh, which includes information security implementation. We do audits. We can do uh, cyber security uh, resilience testing, penetration testing. My focus is on data protection, but we also do business continuity, incident management, uh, and a whole range of uh, software testing consultancy and toolkits. Um, the agenda for this, this hour is to cover uh, a quick overview for those that you haven't uh, uh, looked at the regulations, so a quick overview of the regulatory landscape. We're going to be looking at the territorial scope of the uh, uh, regulation. Uh, we're going to look at some of the, the key remedies, uh, liabilities and penalties. So this is where, if you get it wrong, what the regulation, uh, the enforcement actions and penalties they can take. Uh, we're going to be looking at certainly uh, a core part of the regulation is the privacy principles. I'm going to be quickly covering the privacy principles. Uh, then we're going to look at the specific references of, within the GDPR to policies. Um, and that specifically covers recital 78 and articles 4, 24 and 39. And we'll cover each of those in more detail as we go through. We're going to look at what would happen if you don't have appropriate policies in place. Uh, we're going to look at some of the regulatory actions we currently have. Um, uh, certainly, we're going to be focusing on the UK. That's the jurisdiction I'm most familiar with. So I'm going to sort of pick, pick some statistics from the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, we're going to be looking at what policies you will need to have in place, what policies are required. Um, the regulation doesn't specify specifically, but we're going to be looking at some good practice frameworks. Um, and then we're going to look at how do you develop a policy. So we're going to finish with what are the steps you need to take to develop a policy that will meet your uh, uh, compliance obligations. So firstly, a quick look at European law. There are two types uh, of legislation across Europe, or these are the two main types at least. Uh, we, we're moving away from this directive. Uh, that, that was the old way of doing things with data protection. So we had the Data Protection Directive, uh, and out of that came the UK Data Protection Act in 1998. So the Act is old, the Directive is old. Um, it's nearly over 20 years now. Um, so it's been brought bang up to speed, um, mostly to, to, to cover the, sort of the changing uh, uh, digital and regulatory landscape there. Um, so the issue with the Directive is it was, it was implemented in every member state and it ended up with a sort of a, we ended up with divergence. There was a sort of just checking, uh, I'm going to make sure my slides are changing. Sorry. Okay, you should see the slides now. Sorry about that. So there are two types of legislation. So, so the directive um, ended up with a sort of a patchwork quilt of uh, uh, laws across Europe for, for compliance. The regulation was brought in recently um, such that we can uh, harmonize the approach. Um, so there's no local, uh, no local uh, legislation across Europe now. So it's immediately enforceable. Um, the regulation came into effect in uh, April, uh, sorry, May this year. You can see the key dates there. Sorry, the A, April was when the Council adopted the regulation. We went through various uh, 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 European Parliament and the Commission, uh, and it came into force on the 24th of May of 2016. Now, 
the if you haven't seen the direct uh, the, the regulation uh, there's a link there on on the slide uh, that will take you to the regulation it, it, itself one of the most important parts of the regulation are the uh, the principles um, and they're covered within the GDPR the GDPR is made up of several chapters and you can see on this slide uh, how the GDPR has been set out it's quite an eloquent piece of law uh, and and allegedly one of the most complex and uh, uh, lobbied pieces of law that, that's sort of been through Europe. Um, the key chapters include the sort of the general provisions of the regulation, um, which includes uh, the definitions. Uh, we're not going to cover any of that today. Um, we do cover those sort of things on the foundation course that we offer. We're going to be covering the principles as well. Um, and we're also going to be covering the, the uh, we won't be covering the rights of the data subject, but the policies that we need to have in place need to address that. Um, we're going to be looking at the, the uh, requirements of the controller and the processor. There are some articles here that do reference policies, uh, and we'll be touching on that later. The regulation also talks about transfers of personal data to third countries. Um, so you may need policies around that as well. So we'll be looking at some of the key policies a little later. Um, and the various, the latter part of the, the regulation talks about the, the way the, the regulators are going to be set up. So about the, the requirement for independent supervisory authorities. So each member state will need to have an authority. Uh, in the UK, we have the, uh, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office. In France, we have CNIL. Uh, and, and, and each of the, the member states have their own member uh, a supervisory authority. Um, there's also some discussion within the regulation about how these authorities are going to work together. Uh, so there's a whole chapter in various articles about corporation consistency, uh, and there's a chapter on the specific fines, and that's probably one of the, the big headline uh, 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 taglines from the regulation is these high penalties. A quick build-up of what the regula regulation looks like uh, from a sort of a helicopter perspective. Is, is on the slide now. Um, you should be able to see that the central to this uh, is the data controller. Now, the data controller is the, the organization of the entity that determines the manner and the purpose uh, of the collection of data. Um, the data controller is almost like the center of the universe here because they need to, if you're using a data processor, for example, and a, a processor may be outsourced uh, data processing such as HR payroll, it might be a data center or cloud-based service. So the data processors um, are those organizations that act in accordance with the data controller's requirements. Um, so there may be a policy required here about the supplier relationships. Is there a policy? So in terms of selecting your uh, suppliers, did you do a risk assessment? Is there a requirement to do a risk assessment? Um, and what are the, what's, what's the granular detail about what that risk assessment might look like? So, so this is to give you a steer of where the policies might be required. Um, the data controller also has duties to the, to the data subjects. So here we can see uh, a data subject is any individual um, that gives their data, your, your personal data, to a data controller. So we've got some powerful rights built into this regulation. Uh, things like subject access request, you have the right to be forgotten, you have the right to rectify processing or the right to correct inaccurate data. These are all baked into the regulation itself. So we need to look at policies around subject access requests and around maintaining the confidentiality, the integrity and availability. So for example, an information security policy uh, around the way you manage uh, and safeguard uh, personal data. There may be third parties involved here and these typically may be uh, lawyers or, or solicitors acting on the data subject's behalf. So again, as a data controller, you need to know when you can disclose information. So if somebody calls up or if a police officer comes to your organization and asks for uh, uh, some personal data because of a, a review of a crime that they're investigating, you've got to know uh, and validate whether that's a, a request that you can disclose and what you can disclose. There are certain rules and regulations associated there about what you, what you can disclose. So you may need to look at if you do get uh, lots of questions uh, uh, or, or requirements to, to disclose data to 
not just third parties to the data subjects, you need, may need a policy uh, for staff on, on what they should be disclosing. The final part of this is third countries. Um, you should, if you're exporting uh, or transferring personal data outside of the European Union, um, you may need to have policies in place about how that can happen. There's certainly, you shouldn't uh, export unless you've got one of three things in place. That's either you've done some sort of it's an adequate country, and we're not going to cover that today. Um, the, the Commission has set out what those adequate countries are. Whether you've got a contract in place if you're exporting to, to the entity outside of Europe, um, or whether you've got binding corporate rules in place. So we're not be covering that today, but we give you a sense of where the policies, you might need policies. Um, above the controller and all this is the Information and Commissioner's Office, it's the all supervisory, supervisory authorities. Their role is to, uh, to assess the effectiveness of your controls, the technical and organisational controls. It's also to enforce compliance with the regulation as well. Um, and we'll be looking at what those enforcement and penalties look like. And above the independent uh, supervisory authorities, the overarching piece is the European Data Protection Board. Um, this is, if you're familiar with the regulation right now, we have what we call the uh, Article uh, 29 Working Party. Um, the board is made up of members, representatives from each of the European member states. And they're there to, uh, they have a final binding decision um, if there's any conflict amongst the countries uh, at the supervisory level. A quick look at what Articles 1 to 3 are, it's, it's, it's what is covered by this data, uh, General Data Protection Regulation, um, and it talks about a natural person. natural person is, is a living individual, um, so if you've got any data that relates to a living individual and you can identify uh, an individual from that data, then the GDPR applies, that's the sort of the acid test. Can you identify and identify somebody from that data that you've got? Uh, these natural persons have rights. Uh, they have the right for their data to be protected. Um, they have the right to the protection of the processing of the personal data. And they have the unrestricted movement of personal data across or within the EU. So as an individual moves through the member states, like the freedom of movement that the European uh, Union allows, the data must be able to flow, uh, follow with them. So in some cases, there were cases where uh, data, uh, certain countries may have blocked data leaving the, the, uh, the country. Typically, that sometimes is associated with medical details, etc. Um, but you must, it must allow for, therefore, um, with the uh, data subjects consent for data to move unrestricted with them if they, if they wish so. The material scope um, is quite broad now. It, it relates to any data that's processed wholly or partly, as the regulation calls it, by automated means. Um, and it, in essence, that means if it's on a computer uh, or, or, or a, a, a mobile device, um, that's a, a, an automated system. And it also includes to the paper records uh, personal data that's part of a filing system, or it's intended to be. So if you have, uh, uh, as part of your data capture, uh, you, you, you ask uh, individuals to fill in forms, and those forms are then going to be input into, into a, an automated uh, system, a computer or a database, then that data is included too. The regulation, the big change in, in terms of the regulation is, is that it applies to controllers and processors. Um, processors were usually sort of outside this sort of the, the, the scope of the regulators. Now they're fully in the firing line of regulators. So you need to understand the difference between whether you're a controller or a processor. Um, we're not going to cover that too much today, um, but we will cover that, we do cover that more fully on our uh, uh, Data Protection Foundation course. The scope also applies irrespective of where the processing takes place. So even if you're not based in the European Union, the regulation can, can apply, can and does apply. Uh, so, for example, if you are based in the US or, or, or Africa or, or, or anywhere outside of Europe and you're targeting uh, European citizens 
for data profiling or you're targeting them specifically to sell some goods or services, even though a payment's not required, the regulation now applies. So, so there's this very broad extraterritorial scope that the regulation brings. So this is why you need to bring your policies and procedures up to speed to make sure that you can accommodate that. Um, some of the key penalties here, uh, this is again one of these big headline uh, news stories that where the defines now uh, are up to uh, 4% of your global total world, worldwide turnover. Um, that means up to 20 million euros. That set out in Article 83. Um, the reason for that is that the fines previously, the maximum fines in the UK, for example, were, were up to 500,000. It wasn't seen to be dissuasive. Um, so the regulation has talked about and put into place this, this much more uh, a tiered approach to, to, to finding organizations. There is actually a two-tier approach. So we're not going to touch on that today, but the two tiers are uh, for, a, for a breach of certain articles, uh, that it's up to 2% of the turnover. Uh, for more significant cases where you've been ne negligent or, or, or systematically not sort of taking risks into account, having lack of policies and not taking actions to address that, um, especially if you're processing sensitive personal data, that's the stuff like your health record and criminal records. Uh, that's where the 4% uh, fine will kick in. The 4% fine also applies to uh, breaches of, of the uh, privacy principles. So, and within those principles, it talks about security, and part of that is having appropriate uh, technical and organizational controls. So, really take note of the principles because statistically, that's where the fines have happened under the, the, under the old jurisdiction, under the old data protection regular uh, acts. The principles, Article 5 of the regulation sets out the privacy principles. Um, and quickly, we're going to cover them right now. They are, uh, the first principle is, is that uh, information must be processed fairly and lawfully and in a transparent manner. So here's where that first principle applies to the policies. How do you demonstrate fairness and transparency? The first policy that I'd be looking for to meet this particular principle would be your data protection policy uh, or a privacy policy. Typically, if you've got a website, that'll be that little link uh, we usually find at the bottom of a website, uh, which lists as various policies, and, and normally there you'll find a privacy policy. So you need to ensure that if you if you are processing and you are targeting individuals, that you need to, to have either a privacy policy on your website, which is usually found. And that policy itself will cover in more detail what that should include. It's the, the policies and the fair processing statements need to be given to individuals at the point of collection. They need to know why you're collecting the information, who you are as a data controller, what are you going to do with that data, um, whether you're going to share it with an individual, uh, and whether you're going to export it overseas. The law is quite specific on what those policies should include. Um, and they're set out in some of the articles. Uh, we go into that in much more detail in the foundation course, but we will certainly cover this at a high level now. So the first thing is having, do you have fair processing statements? Um, and then map back that to the regulation which sets out what those statements need to have in place. Principle two, um, you need to be able to, to uh, specify the the processing must be collected for speci specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes. So it's all about the principle of purpose, and it links back to your policy. What's the purpose of collecting the data? Is it, is it for the provision of services? Is it to provide uh, health care? Is it to provide educational requirements? So looking at your, your uh, processing, you need to specify what the purpose is, and that purpose is linked to principle one. You need to explain what that purpose or purposes are in your fair processing statements. Uh, so again, uh, policies and procedures around understanding what information that you've got. Principle three is uh, information must be adequate, relevant, and limited what is necessary. So it's the minimization principle here. Um, often I see organizations and auditor, um, uh, certainly the marketeers, tend to collect 
lots of data which is unnecessary for, unnecessary for the purpose. So for example, competitions uh, or, or filling in a form, they'll often ask for information that's not, not really related to uh, the, the, the service that you're getting. So if it's a competition, for example, do you really need date of birth or home address? Um, uh, or, or other details about an individual to, to uh, process, the, process the competition or the campaign. So really think about what you've got and then try and bring it down. The question there you should be asking is, why do we need that information? Uh, and, and they're always quite uh, strict on what, uh, about keeping that limited to what's necessary. Um, here the, the, the policy that might apply to this particular principle is, the uh, requirement to do uh, privacy impact assessments, where you would look at a work stream to look at the adequacy, uh, would be looking at um, how the privacy principles apply to that particular uh, uh, processing. Principle four is uh, information needs to be kept accurate and uh, where necessary kept up to date. So again, you may need policies that uh, that talk about the integrity of your information, and those and the integrity informs the various more granular level details, such as uh, how do you build in integrity into your processes. Um, do you do you send out an annual uh, uh, email or a letter to to every to to all your data uh, to all your clients to the data subjects to say um, is, is your address correct? Has your name changed if you've got married? Um, have, have any of your details changed? So, what mechanisms do you have to in your processing for individuals to update their data? And do we and do they even know who to talk to? So again, these first four principles talk go back to the fair processing fair processing statement in principle one. The fifth principle is all about retention. Uh, information needs to be retained for only as long as necessary. So here I'd be looking for a retention policy. Uh, and here what you'd need to do is look at the data that you're processing, understand how long do you need to keep it for. Often uh, when we're auditing, we see individuals uh, or organizations keep data forever. Under the eyes of the regulation, that probably won't uh, work out so well. Uh, so they would be questioning, why do you keep it? Uh, so if you could justify it, you may get away with it, but certainly you want to cover that in, in, a, in, a, in a retention policy. Um, the retention policy needs to take account into other laws and regulations, so there may be certain minimum and maximum uh, uh, periods for holding on to the data. So you'd need to work that out and put that into place. Um, and perhaps the most important principle here is, is uh, information must be processed in a manner to maintain its security. Um, and we'll look at this in a bit more detail over the next few slides. Essentially, it's the technical and organizational, organizational safeguards that you'll have in place. So what we're looking for is the governance, risk assessments, we're looking at the training and awareness, we're looking at the physical security, the access controls, so it's a really big domain. <laughs> is security. And finally, accountability. That's not a principle specifically, but it is mentioned as a principle within the regulation in, in the recitals uh, and in, in, the, in, in the introductory text. Uh, and accountability is about who's responsible for data protection within your organization. You don't necessarily need to have a data protection officer, um, but you do need to have somebody that's accountable for making sure that the, the processes that you have um, have been risk assessed if necessary and the appropriate controls are in place. Um, accountability is also who's the individual that would process a subject access request um, or who would an individual complain to if they had uh, an issue that they'd want to take up with somebody about updating their information. So we're looking for the various levels of accountability within the organization uh, to be baked into, into your organizational processes. Specifically, the regulation uh, mentions policies uh, in, in, in several places. Um, first of all, in Recital 78, it talks about an organization needs to be able to adopt internal policies. It doesn't say what they are, uh, but it must be kind of informed by uh, uh, principles such as data protection by design and data protection by default. Um, so there you may have development policies, uh, which include uh, how you develop systems or applications. Um, Article 4 uh, it talks about definitions, and again, it talks about uh, data protection policies uh, in relation to binding corporate rules. 
we're going to be covering it so it doesn't specify what those policies are but we'll look at a good practice framework and we'll explain the sort of policies you might need to have in place in your organization it's all risk-based um, which is why you have a little degree of flexibility um, uh, in implementing this article 24 talks about the responsibilities of data data controller so if you are a controller then you need to uh, uh, understand uh, the, or, or implement appropriate data protection policies. Again, it doesn't tell you what they are, but this is what the regulators will be looking for if, you've, if you're unluckily, unlucky enough to have a breach. One of the first things the regulator looks for is what policies do you have in place. Um, some organizations may need a data protection officer. Those organizations it mentions in the, in the regulation, we're not going to cover it today, but it, 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 certainly if you're a public organization, you will need to have a data protection officer. If you're doing high level, uh, pro, uh, if you're doing systematic profiling and the, the, the processing might, uh, if breach could cause damage, distress uh, to, to an individual, then you might want to consider the law doesn't say whether you must or mustn't, but you've got to consider whether a data protection officer is required. The role of the data protection officer is is, is partly uh, that there's a series of tasks in the regulation, uh, but it talks about monitoring compliance with the policies of the controller or processor. So we're going to look at what if you don't have policies in place and and. We're going to be looking at, I've sourced the UK Information Commissioner's Office for some of these statistics over the next few slides. Um, what you can see here is data breaches by sector. Um, so we can see by far health has attracted the most number of breaches with 184. Um, finance, insurance and credit, those are entities, 25. So we can see pretty much what, what this slide is showing that, that uh, almost every industry sector's suffered a, a, a data breach. Um, but health typically has the highest. Maybe that's because the health sector is more regulated with the NHS. It has its own rules and regulations around uh, uh, healthcare and the protection of patient records. Um, but nonetheless, it, it just shows that, 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 that no sectors better than the other um, but but breaking that down when there is a breach the, the regulator then takes it to well, what's the principle that was breached here and this particular slide is a breakdown of those breaches we saw on the earlier slide and it shows here um, out of all the principles the most by far the, the biggest chunk and the one that you might want to focus your time effort and, and attention on is the principle of data security um, and we'll break that down even further in a moment, but you can see that the other principles about retention, proportionality, fairness, the rights of individuals, they're much, they, they attract fewer complaints and then there's fewer issues associated with those principles. So by far, if you're going to focus your time and attention, if you're putting a program in place, look at your data security processes. So we're going to look at data security in a bit more detail now. So these are the enforcement actions, the reasons that the regulator, certainly in the UK, has pinned a breach of principle seven. It's because of, and if you can see here in this slide, um, a big chunk of this is lack of training, lack of sufficient policy. Those two, in my world, go hand in hand. Lack of policy, lack of training. It's, it's, it's almost a third of the slide there, uh, of, of that pie chart, um, which is why policies are so important. They're a quick win. Um, but just a quick look at, uh, at the other sort of issues that you might have. Um, data disposal you know, or inappropriate data disposal. The cyber attack, um, only 5% of the enforcement actions has been a result of a cyber attack. Accidental loss or theft of data, that's 8%. Um, unsolicited marketing, that's another big one, uh, 12%. Um, unencrypted devices, if there's one thing I would recommend it is to look at if you are processing personal, personally identifiable data on a mobile device or any device, um, make sure that device is encrypted. Um, so that means if it's lost, dropped, stolen, um, you still have a, a, a good level of uh, protection in place. Public disclosure of sensitive data is 5%, um, and processing not in line with data subjects rights is only 1%. 
that might increase, I think, going forward into the new regulations. People become much more aware of their, their data protection rights, this right to be forgotten. I, I, I foresee uh, uh, cases increasing. In fact, um, one of the, the aspects of the regulation requires uh, that, that you must have a process in place if there is a breach that you must communicate to to individuals. So if that's the case, mandatory breach reporting might re, might uh, uh, the ripple effect impact people wanting compensation. So let's look at the the the, the monetary penalties attached to that. So uh, this is just a sum of the penalties dished out. Each for, for each area there. So, so again, lack of training, lack of policy, uh, certainly in the UK, that's totaled up to £270,000. Uh, so it's a big piece of, of uh, uh, making sure a quick win like this can avoid a, a, a hefty fine. Uh, the other areas are, are public data reaches, misdirected communications, unencrypted data, loss of theft, that's had up to £385,000, cyber attacks, £150,000, and unsolicited marketing, £610,000. So, so you can see that policy is an important part of this piece. Um, it's it's a, a big chunk of that pie chart. So what is a policy? Well, a policy is a document um, that defines the objectives of the organization. It's a statement of intent. Uh, policy uh, inform the downstream uh, procedures which outline what people must do in order to deliver the objectives of the policy. Further down that puzzle we've got the guidelines about how to comply with the policy uh, and the policies are typically adopted and signed off by the board or within the senior management within a particular function within your organization. So often when I go into organizations I ask the first question I would ask is can I have a look at your policies and often I see too many policies. This next slide sort of shows what I, what's good practice uh, is, is the kind of a pyramid structure where we see a few policies at the top that everybody knows about, everybody's aware of, and everybody can, complies with. The policies inform the procedures. We expect to see more procedures at this level. That's how to implement the policy. The procedures may have work instructions, so they're now going much more granular uh, about making the policy and the procedures work. The procedures may be sort of step-by-step step instructions uh, about how to perform an individual task. Um, then finally, at the bottom of the pyramid are, are the records. Now, going back to one of the, the seventh principle I mentioned earlier about accountability, a big part of the regulation is now about making organizations keep sort of evidential quality records. So if you say it's no good anymore to say, yeah, we've got policies in place, they're going to be looking down through this kind of pyramid structure to see how does that policy uh, uh, come alive in your organization? How are people aware of it? Um, and often what do I see in terms of uh, auditing organizations against uh, adequacy is uh, there's many records, but uh, many policies, for example, but very few procedures, fewer still work instructions, and fewer still uh, records. Uh, so don't worry, we, I will be giving you a copy of the slide at, little, uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, but that's what we're looking for. So if you go back to your organization and, and ask, uh, uh, where are the policies? Do you have a policy framework? Um, and people can't find the relevant policy. That to a regulator, gives an indication that your policy framework is not effective. It's no good just to say, yes, you've got a policy in place just because it's a register requirement. It has to be uh, effective um, and understood and communicated. This next slide looks at, um, well, what are the policies and procedures that you might need to have in place? This slide is based on a, 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 a good standard framework called, it's a British standard, BS 112, uh, which is a, what we call a privacy uh, information uh, management system, a personal data information management system. There, there are certain policies here uh, and procedures that we'd expect to see in place for a good effective framework. So looking at the policies that I expect to see in place, right at the top there, I'd be expecting to see a data protection policy. Um, that's m almost mandatory. Um, what we're looking for here is um, where where is that policy? 
because the data protection policy is meant to be seen by your data subjects, you're telling them it's your fair processing statement, it's telling me who you are, who to write to if you've got an issue or a complaint, um, it's telling them about uh, what you're collecting, why you're collecting it, who you're sharing the information with. So that data protection policy is kind of central and informs all the other documents and procedures around it. Um, related to data protection policy is the training and awareness. How do you make people aware of the, the information you've got in, uh, uh, of the policies in place. So if you have a protection policy, data protection policy, you need to make sure it's communicated across all staff. Um, they know where it is um, and that, that policy is updated uh, uh, to take into account to changes to regulation, codes of practice that will be emerging over time. Um, for the more, for the larger organizations, as I expect to see an audit and compliance policy. So one of the key requirements to demonstrate effectiveness is, is to, to check. Um, so one of the things I'll be looking for is what are you auditing and when? So for all those technical and organizational controls, um, if you're telling people this is the way it should be done in the guidance, the process, how often do you check to make sure they are following and compliant and adhering to your policies and processes? So you, ideally you want to do a, 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 an audit of your processes um, at least annually, um, maybe more frequently depending on the risk and the nature of the processing that you have in place. Related to that, going down through the, the work stream there is the compliance standards. So, so here it's what are the baseline controls that, that an auditor that we can check against. So a baseline standard might be uh, uh, sort of the, the IT build of a laptop, that it must be encrypted, that it must be, it must have password enforced. Uh, and so those standards are, are related to the data protection policy and the information security policy that said information must be protected. And this is how the IT department, for example, might implement that policy. Um, you may need an information security policy as well. Now information security, the three main attributes of that are the confidentiality of the information, the integrity of the information, and the availability of the information. All those three in combination are the information security inform the, the various standards that you might need to have in place. So, so related to confidentiality, um, what controls do you have in place to demonstrate the confidentiality of the information? So confidentiality means information can only be uh, disclosed to those that are authorized to see it. So now I'm looking at who can log on to your system, who's got access to the systems processing the personal data, who authorizes the access, uh, uh, do you do a review of access, um, what, what are the various, is the segregation of duties in place? Um, and are, are, do you have sort of roles and, and uh, uh, role-based access control processes in place? So for confidentiality, I'm looking at the various access controls and processes. For integrity, I'm looking at, at uh, processes related to, so if the policy talks about integrity, the integrity controls might be verifying or validating a data subject. It's about uh, keeping the data accurate and up-to-date. So these are the various controls I'd be looking downstream from that, that, that high-level policy of maintaining the integrity, uh, validating the information. That might even go down into your development policy, which talks about if people are inputting information online, that, that there are often uh, sort of little uh, uh, boxes which will validate the information. So if you're inputting date of birth, for example, it, it, it talks about a specific format that, that if you don't enter, enter the date of birth in a particular format, the system doesn't accept it. So you end up with a much more accurate uh, and consistent way of capturing data. So that's the integrity side. And then availability is basically information needs to be available when required. So, so here you may have a business continuity policy uh, or a disaster recovery plan, uh, which relates to keeping that information available when it's required. These then inform the audit processes and the procedures. Um, selecting auditors is important too. You can't select uh, individuals that are part that, that, that are responsible for the process. There has to be a level of independence. Um, you mainly also need to do, if you are using data processes you, or, or exporting data outside of Europe, 
um, due diligence and third party audit procedures. So if you are using your processes, um, when was the last time, what does your policy say, or do you even have a policy on, on, on auditing suppliers that you have? Um, certainly if they're, if they're cloud-based or if they're processing of the data on your behalf, um, when was the last time you went in to check what they were doing uh, and whether they're also uh, aware of your policies? And those policies are usually set out uh, within contracts or certainly there are certain clauses and provisions within those contracts that set out what that process should be, should be doing. So, so how often do you check that they're doing what they say they're doing? Again, that's quite a common one that's missed. And I think that's also going to be one of the most common areas with supply chain uh, that's going to become increasingly important. Um, often we see uh, when auditing when there's a breach, we're not going to be looking to any breaches today, but the breach was not the controller that, that breached the information. It was one of their suppliers that had a breach of the data. Um, and, and so the regulator is going to come down like a ton of bricks on both the controller and the processor. It will be your, your fault as the controller for not having appropriate controls in place and for not checking uh, or auditing your suppliers. So how often do you audit them? When do you audit them? So a policy around uh, third-party audits. Um, we need policies around data collection procedures. Um, so, so how it defines how the marketing or the HR or the IT teams might collect the data. Um, that might be through a certain uh, mechanism. It might be, does the information come, how, how do you collect it? Does it come in via email, via, via uh, uh, letters, through the post? Uh, does it come in through the call centers? So again, we're looking at the policies around how that data is collected. Um, and how it should be processed. So, so if it comes into the mailroom, is the mailroom secure? So we're looking at physical security now uh, and policies around basic minimum standards for physical security and how does the mail team then hand that on to uh, the, the, the ultimate recipients? So we're looking again at the procedures and policies around there, protecting that data throughout the life cycle. Um, data use procedures about who can handle the data. Um, a common area error I see here is is, is that uh, nobody really knows who's got access to the information. Certainly, in the larger, smaller to medium uh, uh, enterprises, is is that. Uh, they may have outsourced information and uh, the outsourcer may have outsourced again. They may have subcontracted. So all of a sudden we've got what we thought was a tightly controlled system that, that dozens of, of individuals within the organization or even within suppliers have access to the information which hasn't been approved, which hasn't been validated and is not, doesn't seem to, fall, it seems to fall outside of the usual sort of standard uh, data access process procedures. So that's what we're looking for there. Um, we're looking at your contracts as well. So going back to uh, managing due diligence, um, data sharing agreements or policy for data sharing, which set out specifically who the, the, the controllers are, who the processors are, and what you can and can't do with the data that you've got. Um, you may be data controllers in common, so you're pooling, you're sharing information amongst various other entities. Um, you may be, uh, uh, or it's a simple controller to processor agreement, but nonetheless, those agreements need to be sort of watertight now uh, to set out the liabilities about who's responsible for what. We're looking at document and record control. So this is more about the information you've got now. So what kind of policies do you have in place around document and record control? Now we're talking going down through about data quality. How do you make sure the data is up to speed or accurate and up to date? Uh, we're looking at the data retention and archive procedures. Again, retention is one that the organizations don't do very well. I've seen from my experience where they will point to a basement or an attic, uh, you know, an old building, uh, and in the attic and basement is an Aladdin's cave of, of boxes upon boxes of, of, of uh, personal data records from, from past, which ideally should either be archived or, 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 or deleted or destroyed securely. So what is your data retention policy? And I'll be looking how, into how effective that policy would be. So here um, I'm looking at uh, what triggers the archive, what triggers the data destruction. And again, if you're using a third party for the data destruction, like one of these shredded type companies that come to site or they take your, your, your paper records away or your, your, or your old uh, IT equipment to be, to be destroyed, 
do what's your policy there? Do they do they give you a certificate of destruction? Uh, do they give you a list of what they destroyed and when it was destroyed and how it was destroyed? So you really need to be very careful with the contracts to make sure that your data disposal procedures are up to speed as well. Um, we're looking at subject access requests, so we know we know that subject tax uh, individuals now have very powerful rights. So we're looking at the procedures you have in place. So if an individual wants to complain, or they want to have access to our data, they want to change it or, or, or update it, who do they write to? And how do you validate who they say they are? So again, a policy around subject access requests. I don't see many, most uh, organizations have typically don't get many access requests at the moment. If you're in the public sector, you probably get more. Um, but it's probably going to be an area which is going to grow as people become aware of their rights. So certainly you want to have a process in place for, for subject access for requests, uh, for managing complaints, um, etc. Finally, we'll be looking at uh, risks. So we're looking at how do you manage risk from your organization. So do you have a risk management methodology which informs uh, certainly the policies and the controls you've got in place. Uh, so what's your strategy for, for risk management? Uh, and that should inform the various policies you have in place as well. So how do you develop a policy? Well, first of all, you've got to un understand the objectives. A policy is a statement of intent. So step one, what are you trying to proceed, uh, protect here? So looking back at the previous slide, we, we looked at the various objectives and then sort of the key areas that each policy might require, the areas where you might need a policy. Now we need to be a little bit more specific about what the objectives of that policy is. So for example, if we tend, we need to keep data for a minimum necessaries is the policy. Then the more granular piece is, well, what is the time, the minimum maximum time frames? Um, you need to be aware of what the expectations of the interested parties, which should inform the policy. So the, the interested parties, uh, certainly one of them would be the regulators. And I suggest you get in touch with your uh, local regulator under in the UK. So in the, if you're in the UK, it's the ICO. There's a, whole, there's a ton of guidance that these uh, regulators provide. And these the regulators in, in most cases, the, certainly the larger countries have a very good uh, uh, advisory network. And codes of practice. So understanding what the inter in your interested parties are looking at, the what you, the needs and expectations of your clients and customers are um, about protecting their data. So identify those objectives. Develop a policy framework. So that goes back to the slide I showed you a moment ago. So it's looking at what are all the policies we need to have in place, and then going down through those policies, the policy informs the procedure, the process, the guidance, then ultimately the records. So we're looking at a framework. Um, that framework requires governance. It needs who's responsible for the policy, how often is the policy reviewed, and does it include, does the policy, is it supported by those more granular uh, records and procedures? So often, as I said earlier, we, we have lots of policies, but very few uh, guidance documents. That's not good enough. It's, it's very difficult to say, yes, we've got a policy in place, but we don't know how to comply with that policy. So if that's the case, think about whether that policy needs to be uh, uh, communicated and review to make sure the people that are looking up to that policy understand what it means to them, what it means to their processing, and how they need to handle that data. You need to communicate the policies and enforce the policies. So this is where the uh, your, your, your ideally some sort of a training and awareness program, periodic refreshes at least annually. I would say as a minimum of the policies. And ideally, how do you know it's effective? Often we see people have been on a training course, an e-learning course, just a, a matter of a week, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and you ask them what did they learn, they kind of look at you uh, and, and say something to do with data protection, uh, but they don't really, they can't apply the policy to their role. So if that's the case, you need to make sure you're training the awareness specific to the 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 the, uh, the function or the area uh, of the data processing, and then you need to check the effectiveness of the policy. Often that's done through uh, maybe a test, uh, so a series of questions about the policy, uh, or, or even better, scenario-based training. So, so you, you, it's like the workshop approach, um, and also through audits. So, an auditor may go to an organisation, he may pick on a function or an individual and ask them about the policies and be looking at how effectively that policy has been applied. Okay, and finally, um, uh, you need to review and update those policies. The policies. Um, 
uh, will change over time. They shouldn't change too often. They're typically very high level, but they are living documents uh, and they do need periodic review. So I'd be looking for a policy owner. I'd be looking for as a minimum on each policy uh, when it was last updated. That's that's kind of part of the doc control uh, control of records process or policy. So make sure that, they, that there's ownership on the policies and you've got uh, when the policies were last updated uh, and then that framework should show who's responsible, how you train people, how you communicate and how you check their effectiveness. So in summary, over the next few minutes, um, it, the GDPR it basically covers all forms of it. It's a massive overhaul of the data protection framework. It covers all forms of personally identifiable information. It now includes uh, areas such as uh, biometric data, genetic data, location data. So it's a much broader scope. And it applies across all member states of the European Union, and it even applies to organisations processing data of EU citizens wherever they are based in the in the, in the world. Um, there are new, more powerful rights uh, of data subjects, and there are tough obligations on both the controllers and processors. Um, that's for a different. Uh, uh, that's on our foundation cost about what those regu what those uh, rights are, uh, uh, obligations are. Um, but the regulation is quite specific about the, what they are. So there are certain articles which set out specifically what you should be doing as a controller or processor. Um, it includes things now mandatory uh, changes include things like privacy by design, um, if you're developing systems or applications that you build in privacy uh, right up front in, in, in the initiation pro process. Um, the other big thing to watch out for are these massive new penalties. Uh, 20 million euros is quite a, a 4% of your turnover. Global turnover is designed to be dissuasive and that should start to see much more attention, much more traction and fewer breaches. Uh, so going back to the slide earlier about why, do, why is the regulation put in place? Well, those the number of breaches we saw, uh, I think I did a, a review of August, number of breaches across the world, in Europe, uh, across the world uh, I think there were about 49 big breach. So when I talk about a breach, I'm talking about millions of bits of data and health data being disclosed accidentally or deliberately. They were hacked. Um, and then there are fines. Uh, so, so they take into account these fines are designed against the principles and specifically, as we saw earlier, about the technical and organizational measures. That's where the focus is going to be. Because if you look at any of the breaches, if you look at the newspaper headlines when they come out, when there's like the talk talk, you know, or the Sony breaches, the big ones that hit the, the, the sort of the national news, look at what went wrong. And if you look, more deeply, you often start to see, well, it's a basic failure of the policy and what the policy and the information that the policy, the cascade of that information, the granular detail of what that policy should do. So that leaves me almost bang on time with the questions. So um, if you can use the, uh, the chat function, uh, if you type your messages there, I'll spend a minute or two for you to uh, type your questions. Uh, I hope that was useful. As I said, I will. we will arrange for the slides to be sent out to all those that are on the call today, uh, and that should be with you uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, thank you for your time today. That brings us up to the top of the hour. Um, so uh, I hope that was useful. Uh, as I say, the slides will be sent out. Thanks for your time, and uh, have uh, enjoyed the rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>